I'm a sparkly little gentleman. I'm just a silly little guy. That's what I say. You go girl. You go girl. You go. You go girl. I'm really obsessed with this idea of dressing like a man. I don't know why. This is just gonna be my thing now. Nobody question it. It's just a costume. It's just a character. Don't even worry about it. Yeah, I really like Stacey's mom. Mate, have the best job. My job is to look hot and party with gay people. I made pretty good life choices. I was the first drag king to be on and win a reality television program in New Zealand and the world. So that's cool. I can be honest about what's been going on. I am a recovering addict, five years sober off everything. Congratulations. Apart from nicotine and sugar and masturbation, you know. All the good yeah, ones. Yeah, 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 just the good ones. And for as long as I can remember, I was very fucking uncomfortable. How do you just know that everything is wrong? And it's like, I don't know, man, you just, you just fucking do. I think I know the answer to this, and that is I want to make people happy. It's the most underrated thing in art and in the world. Kia ora and welcome to Where Creatives Connect. My name is Jamie Sharp and this is the podcast that brings you creative folk and artists from all over the world. Whether they be drag artists, whether they be musicians, actors, you name it, I have them on. And my job is to dive into the behind the scenes of what they do, their creative practices and processes, and really what makes them who they are. I'm joined today by a wonderful human who I had the delight of watching perform this time last week as I entered the country on a, on a fabulous evening called Arcadia, full of beautiful wine, drag, right in the shadow of the Auckland Sky Tower. George Fowler, welcome to the podcast. Stop it. Thank <laughs> you for having me. You're so welcome. And I do apologise for not telling you that it was filmed. It's true. I, th I mean, podcast, one presumes it is audio. Yeah. I would have showered. I would have put a shirt on that I didn't get from my gymnasium's lost property. I washed it, but it... You know. Well, I think you look great. So Thank you. Do it's not my worry true it. form. You're seeing me authentically. The first question I normally ask guests is if you were in the back of an Uber or you're on a plane, say going back to Christchurch, you're from Christchurch, aren't you? Um, I mean, originally, I grew originally. up there, yes, yeah. And somebody used to ask you what you do for your career. Oh, no. What do you tell them? Oh, sometimes I say I'm an event manager because that's nice and plain. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I'm dressed up, I say I'm a performer. Why do you sometimes go for the plane option? Um, I'm never direct, um, even when I am literally in costume and drag. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's just an instinct where you don't know where people's literacy about what drag is. And also you just don't know how chill people are. Mm. Um, so I don't think any Uber driver, for example, if we're just going to use Uber drivers as an example, have ever identified me as a drag performer. Okay. They'll be like, party tonight? And I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to a party tonight. That's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. I suppose a lot of your performances in involve partying. They, like... mate, I have the best job. What is up, party people? Good to see your face here again. I really do appreciate it. Just two things from me. First one, George and I do some swearing in this podcast. Woo! So if you've got some young ears around you, or you're mortally offended by swearing, then it sucks to be you, doesn't it? Second one from me, do me a favour, hit subscribe. It was awesome to see last week, nearly 2,000 of you tuned in to watch across different platforms, YouTube, Apple Pods, uh, Spotify, but only 12.2% of you are following or subscribed. So just, if you're on YouTube, just literally hit subscribe now. Other than that, get on with it. Go and enjoy. Peace. Mate, I have the best job. My job is to look hot and party with gay people. I made pretty good life choices. Absolutely. Especially as someone who, as evidenced by right now, dresses like a thumb most of the time. It's quite fun to suddenly be like, yeah, I do actually get paid to like dance in my underwear on podiums at like big gay underwear parties, you know? So stupid. Talking of a look, imagine this look for me. Okay. Magazine in hand with Rachel Hunter on the front. Oh. Schoolboy. Oh no, outfit. you've done your research. I really have. I'm horrified. To the music of Stacey's mom. Correct. Is this your first performance publicly yes. as a drag performer? Yes. Talk us through how you got to that moment. No, I have questions first. How long did it take you? Scroll back on Instagram? like Bit of scroll back on Instagram. Yeah. I've read about 20 news paper things. Crikey. I'm um, horrified. I'm flattered. 
I'm Good. a little bit afraid. <laughs> you should be. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was my first ever performance. It was for the Menagerie, which is this amazing, it doesn't run anymore, but it used to be this monthly variety show in Wellington. And so many incredible performers have gone through there. But that's where I got my start. And I don't know. Like, it really is a very big blur because I was working some shit out mm. and I was really, really obsessed with this idea of dressing like a man. I don't know why. This is just going to be my thing now. Mm. Nobody question it. It's just a costume. It's just a character. Don't even worry about it. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I really like Stacey's mom. And I thought that would be, f I just thought it would be funny. Fair enough. That's it. Was that your first guise of Hugo Girl? Yeah. From somebody that hasn't developed a drag persona, how do you go through the process of, starting one up is it you build it over time does it does it change has it changed it has changed and it's changed if we're just talking about not me but like drag in general yeah. the process of creating a drag character has has changed so drastically in the last decade so like originally so you would have had like a drag mother who would have taught you everything and helped you source it everything because it would have been so difficult drag queens talk about like the weird places you would need to find all the niche equipment you need to do this thing because it wasn't mainstream mm. like now you can go to one website buy everything you need there's an overwhelming abundance of online resources in terms of like how to paint a face and how to like affix a wig and all of those things and now now whether someone whether someone looks good in a photo or just standing in an outfit is no longer an indication of whether they'll be good on stage because you can now paint a drag face because the internet can tell you how to. You know, it's not necessarily like a learned and curated skill where you have to learn your own face and figure out all these tricks by trial and error. Of course, you still have to do that to be excellent, mm. but the availability of information has like changed our industry drastically. That's very interesting. Something I hadn't really considered as well. I suppose it's the Instagram it is. thing, isn't it? I don't it's know what you call it. It's the Instagramification. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's a, it is a huge phenomenon in drag is like uh, being internet famous is very different to being a good performer. A fabulous stage performer. Yep. Yeah. In fact, they are completely different things. For people that haven't seen you perform, how do you describe Hugo Girl to them? I say I'm a sparkly little gentleman. I'm just a silly little guy. Yeah, that's what I say. And usually I'm explaining what a drag king is. So I'm like, mm. it's it's just, I'm like, a, I'm a sparkly man. That's all, that's all it is. Yeah, because people are very familiar with drag queens and what that social construct is and does. I'm like, I do all the exactly the same things. I just have a beard on at the same time. Reading the different news articles, am I right in thinking you were one of the first or the first drag king to kind of make a big presence in New Zealand? The answer to that question is super complicated because like drag kings have existed forever as long as there's been gender diversity. But yes, I was the first drag king to be on and win a televised reality television program in New Zealand and the world. Um, so that's cool. That's a cool little <laughs> headline of the Wikipedia article, you know. Um, so yes, I'm kind of in the forefront in that way. That's very cool. Let's jump straight to that TV show. Let's do it. House of Drag. Yeah. Was it the first season in New Zealand and yep. you won it? I've not watched it yet. Yeah, no, don't. Yet. They've actually taken it down. Oh, have they? Well, now I did that, look. I did yeah, look. I couldn't find yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now we've got the real thing. Now we've got RuPaul's Drag Race Down Under. Um, it's mysteriously disappeared off TVNZ On Demand. <gasps> How fascinating. Mm. Um, it was very low budget uh, as far as TV shows go, of course. And uh, my drag, I definitely have not rewatched. So this was, it was four years ago. Okay. So I haven't. Four and a half coming up on <gasps> horrific. Anyway, <laughs> my drag is much, much better now. Um, and I cringe. I cringe to think about what it would have been like. But like, I was, I was so proud at the time. I did not, I was so hyper aware that I was the first drag king to be included in a show like this. And I was oh, the yeah. only king on the show. Oh. And I was like, I had very, very humble goals and was very, I was like, I want to 
my goals were like three episodes at least would be awesome. And all I wanted to do was like visually compete. A thing that drag kings struggle with is like we're we're usually shorter people because we are like assigned female at birth and like we've got smaller faces. And then when you're playing with masculine tropes instead of feminine tropes, like um, with femininity, with a like the drag queen trick is like everything's bigger, so it makes your body look smaller and more feminine and so you play with proportion that way and then also like feminine things like big flowing hair dresses tits hips these are all things that get bigger and bigger and so visually competing with drag queens as a drag king is actually really tricky um and it's super fun trying to figure out all those masculine tricks it's like doing drag on expert mode there's, there's almost a su- well there is a science to it by yes. the sounds of it and i it's, it's a bit like the science of beauty. Um, when I was at music college, we were studying about the golden ratio and how yeah. that relates to sound. And then uh, did a module on art and architecture. But then really, it's kind of the same thing within drag about how maybe not only you make yourself look and appear and perform, but how you compare to others as well. Yeah. Did that come into play when you were emceeing and devising Arcadia for last week in terms of thinking about who you would work well with, not only as as a human being, but visually, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for coming, by the way. It was amazing. So nice. It was brilliant. It it really was. And if, are you doing another one? Yeah. Right. If if you're in Auckland, you should go. St. Kevin's Arcade? St. Kevin's Arcade. So it's like a drag dinner cabaret, Mm. you know, classic. Um, but we take, we take over the end of St. Kevin's Arcade, which is like this beautiful little laneway off K Road. Um, so yeah, in terms of proportion and scale, Mm. there's no stage in that space and we move amongst tables. So that influenced, um, all the costume planning because no one could see anything below your thighs down, but in order to like, feel like we were filling the space, we needed to add a lot of height and volume on the top. So um, none of this is an original idea. Like drag performers have been doing this forever, but we went for that like classic showgirl, like big feathers, big organza, things that move up high. Um, Yeah, and having all three of us in the space at the same time to make it feel really full and immersive. Um, And it totally worked. And I'm so, I feel like it's been years coming. Like dinner and a show is magic. It's like so magic. I've been basically like, trialing and erroring a bunch of random events um for so long trying to get this like beautiful combination and I feel like with Jamaisy Street and their incredible team and then this incredible space I were I've just gotten so lucky with these the people around me not least this like amazing queer owned sound and lighting company who like transformed the space it just all the little pieces came together. It really did. And uh, there was a few extra things I was thinking about as well. It's not just you performing in terms of like a declamatory performance of here I am, look at me, do this. It was all the things that led up to it. So the meet and greet at the start and making people feel comfortable and also alluding to what's going to happen. And then your emceeing as well, which was excellent, really, really good. You've got to sort of lure people into a sense of being comfortable but also up for it as well and that's a really really big skill Mm. that you absolutely nailed it's not just a confidence thing it's like a really it's it's having a finger on the pulse of what the room is saying as well Mm. um and that also came about when you brought the people up to perform wild (laughs) your um doubling back a point before we talk about that chaos um yeah what you're describing you described drag exactly yeah all of those things are things that great drag events do naturally. But yeah, drag performance is an expert in breaking the fourth wall. It's why people love seeing it live is because it's like super immersive and like it's a cult of personality, which is a good and a bad thing. But that's why people are so obsessed with it is because you you fall in love with these like big human cartoons. Yeah. Um, yeah, audience participation was friggin' wild. So like, there's no way of knowing what the vibe, the tone of the event would be. This is definitely like one of the most expensive events I've ever run just because the food is so beautiful. Um, and so I was like, are we going to keep it cl- like, what is this? And I didn't even want to do an audience participation. It got added in last minute because they've sent me what they, the restaurant thought the run sheet was going to be. There was one more course than I thought there was. I was like, Jesus, people are getting banged for their buck. How are we going to fill this extra 
round. Mm. And I was like, well, we add in audience participation. And then it was the wildest thing I've, it's, I have, it's one of the wilder audience participation segments I've ever seen. It was wild. The people that you brought up, it felt like they were performers in their own right. No. Nah. No. Nah, they nah. weren't. None of them. One of them, I think, just happened to be quite bendy. I was like, did you used to dance? And she's like, yeah, I guess so, but should just like do a, you know, like a, a jump split. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was wild. Um, and then one of them was just a gay slut. So <laughs> great. And then you've got your bloke, straight blokey bloke. Mm, and he was really blokey. Was and like, it was his birthday as well, wasn't it? Like, yeah, the gentleman who had absolutely no choice on where he was going this evening and had a good time of it, despite, despite of that. I'm led to believe it was a drag queen's idea, but I just turned around and Rob, the straight dude, is walking across tables. Like he'd climbed up and was like, yeah, he was being very naughty. And um, yeah, I was like, ah! you know me so anxious to like prove to this really fancy Mentro top 50 restaurant that this is like a wonderful classy cultural thing that they should do turn around and there's a dude walking across the table their table <laughs> and we well, handled it very well that's a lie i screamed rub, rub no get down <laughs> just like we turned into the shrieking little pufter panicked went absolutely speechless um uh, I didn't, I don't think I handled that very well at all, but it was utterly hilarious. It was hilarious. Yeah. Everybody was up for it. And I was very grateful that you didn't bring me up. Um, or... There's no way. There's Thank no you. way. You gauge the vibe, my friend. Yes. You gauge the vibe. Yes. Do you think your emceeing ability, which is excellent. That's very kind of you. Has something to do, am I right in thinking your parents are English teachers? Wow, you're so creepy. Oh, yeah, keep it. Jamie. <laughs> Do you think there's some link there? Because you're linguistically very good. That's very nice of you. Um, I think I did speech and drama for like a decade, and that helped for sure. But also it comes from a deep fountain of insecurity. So I think... I am always energetic when I talk on the microphone, which when I started really set me apart. Um, and I think that comes from like, a, are you sure you guys are all right? We can, what, what do you need? You know, like it was like that, that like. Wanting to please. Ah, yeah. Um, and this, this thing in particular. Um, yeah. When I'm on a microphone, it's usually like quite, that's always a vibe, you know, um, we're going to have a great, we're going to have, a, we're going to have a great time. We're, I'm going to make sure we have a great time. Um, so I think my temperament suits me quite well for generous hosting. Um, but yeah, I'm not a, I'm a, I'm a host. I'm not a comic. Mm. There's like a really big difference. People are like, you want to do a seven minute spot at this thing? I'm like, I've never done stand up in my life. Yeah. Yeah. I've just, I just host. And it's that, that thing where you're like, I'm going to prep you for something amazing. that's about to happen. Let me like raise the energy in the space so that you can be an amazing generous audience for these other people you're like this role where you're like of service like for some reason I know how to do that but that thing where it's like just talking on your the stand-up is like a, it's just a completely different still skill set I spoke to somebody not too long ago about exactly that mm. it wasn't on the podcast but it was to do with where the spotlight has been shone they were a very funny person mm. and they said that they couldn't do stand-up because they felt like the spotlight is on them and their ego whereas when they're just riffing or when they're being funny in real life mm. they're able to make it about whatever is in front of them and i suppose that's what you're saying that's really nice i really like that where it's like reactive mm. um yeah it's not like i've thought of this funny joke i'm gonna tell it now it's just like it's like party management yeah, maybe yeah. that could be your job title when people ask you. Party manager. Party manager. Yeah. Um, Neil Thornton is uh, runs the New Zealand Comedy School. It's a really, really good all rounder. But his metaphor is that being a host is is being a dinner party host. You're like, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We're gonna have a great night tonight. Here's all the shit you need to know. So bathrooms are over here, and this person's already too drunk, and um, uh, you know, like, and then you do the. The back of house stuff, yeah. yeah. And I just think it's like the best, the best metaphor ever. I love that. Yeah. A generous host. So the person you're describing who's like, sounds like they're an amazing person in social situations, that's all hosting is. So true. Take us back. What's the earliest context we need to know about you to understand 
the journey that you've come on to become a drag performer and who you are today? Sure. Well, the drag performer to transgender human pipeline is a well-trodden one. I've been doing drag for over eight years and I'm 32 now. So I think I started when I was 24-ish. It is just totally a blur, but something like a broken me. And I just started like, like uh, flip-flopping pretty much between just like hyper femme or just like op shop menswear. Um, but compartmentalized that obsession. You know, I was suddenly just like obsessed with trans men on the internet, obsessed with the idea of drag kings. Um, and compartmentalized it as like a performing arts thing. So I was surrounded by like people who were doing artistic things. Um, and I was like, oh, well, that's, that's what's happening. Um, and of course that was part of it. And yeah, then it's just literally a blur of like making, making stuff in my bedroom alone, usually late at night, um, of like figuring out stuff. And yeah, then just like spat out on stage and slowly got, I was, I was, I mean, you probably know, you just scroll back far enough on Instagram and it's like, oof, okay, baby, baby drag king. Um, and then slowly, slowly just got the hang of it. Um, and honestly, I think something that's really helped my drag get better and better and me to be more flamboyant in my aesthetics and more flamboyant on stage is coming out and being comfortable with my gender identity because suddenly femininity got like divorced from womanhood it became this sort of like ugly unladylike extravagant thing that's like I'm so comfortable being um camp now and yeah I mean that's what makes a fabulous drag full stop mm. just being outlandish um so when I started it was quite reserved I was really really um paranoid about being appearing masculine and and doing masculinity properly spoiler alert you know <laughs> I would but I would spend I spent like weeks in front of the mirror trying to control my friggin hands mm. and I just I couldn't get it right and even like early feedback that I got from industry people was like well you really need to work on your like um your characterization because you're you're not coming off as very masculine. And it was, deep, of course, deeply hurtful at the time. But, like, jokes on them. Like, I'm a campy little faggy man. And that's my character. And that's what makes me lovely is because I'm not. So, like, and so many drag kings are. Mm. And that's, like, super valid. But, like, um, now when people get me mistaken for a drag queen, I don't take it as as... as the ginormous insult it once was mm. because I'm like, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm doing. Like, you're not wrong. I'm just like a different breed. You mentioned about getting feedback there. Mm. I'm intrigued. Over time, do you actively put yourself in front of other drag performers and say, can you critique me? Does it, or do you go, like, I don't know, how, how does it work? Mm. It's tricky. And I think it's tricky because... We're going to veer into another, I promise I'll answer this. Sure. Like drag as an industry is completely unregulated. Mm. Like you don't go to school for a drag, but there's so much money in it <laughs> and it's a so wi widely viewed thing. And also there's the internet. So it is an incredibly critiqued art form, um, but uh, finding ways to safely and constructively get and give feedback and creating those spaces so few and far between in this industry at every level. So that's, that's really, really tricky. It's always community, right? Um, and there's people I actively ask for feedback from and uh, people I trust hugely. Mm. And then there's people I say, thank you so much and move on <laughs> and don't take that feedback at all. That's a healthy approach though, because if you took it all on, no. Nah. And to heart, yeah. you'd be a mess. Yes, and you would be. And it's very, very easy to become a mess really quickly. Yo, just a quick one from me. I'm currently traveling across New Zealand. And one thing that I bring with me every single day to keep myself safe is my Nord VPN. And you too can stay safe by following my link in the description below. If you're not too sure what a VPN is, a VPN essentially allows you to be James Bond online. Stay undercover and stay safe. There are literally millions of ways for people to steal your details online and use them for their own benefit. And we don't want that. If you use my link, not only does it 
it massively help out the podcast, but it gives you up to 68% off a two-year subscription with three months extra free. Stay safe online, use NordVPN, on with the podcast. Yeah. You mentioned money then. Mm. There was a moment in your life where you left your bar job mm. and decided to dive full, mm. full into uh, drag. Mm. Well, am I right in thinking you were living in a caravan on someone's <laughs> drive for a little while? <laughs> yes. Yes, I was living in a caravan. I bought a caravan off my friend. It was not functional, but it was functional enough for us to get it from somewhere in the fucking heart to Ara Valley. And we basically just, I stayed, I had it in that car park for as long as the neighbors next door would let me before I sold it on for absolutely no money. But it was just a bed, you know, mm. just a bed in the driveway. It worked out. It absolutely did. It, was that a really scary time, though? No, I was a mess. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I was I was very transient at that point in my time, point in time. The factor of this story is that I am a uh, recovering addict. I am five years sober off everything. Congratulations. Apart from nicotine and sugar and masturbation, you know, yeah. just all, the essential all the good, ones. All the good yeah, ones. Yeah, 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 just the good ones. I mean, it's classic, like deeply unhappy. I'm presuming that your readers have some understanding of what being transgender is, but I was assigned female at birth um, and raised and socialized as a woman. And uh, for as long as I can remember, I was very fucking uncomfortable. Um, and it's a pretty strange phenomenon to describe to someone. Um, like, how do you just know that everything is wrong? And it's like, I don't know, man, you just, you just fucking do. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm so glad that there's more literacy now around what being trans is, because if I knew what that word meant earlier, mm. um, it would have saved me a lot of suffering. And of course, there's a million other things going on that contributed to um, me being just loving, not being present in my own body. But uh, I would say uh, having a body that did not match who I was was a huge part of that. So I spent uh, most of my adult life between being about 17 to I don't know five years ago 27 yeah so it was it was over a decade wow. completely fucking blotter yeah um and came out and pretty pretty like matter of months after articulating with my mouth out loud um that I was in fact a man um I got sober really quickly after that because I think honesty is like infectious I was suddenly like I can be I can be honest about what's been going on um and it felt so good to like start to fix my life a little bit maybe I was like hopeful for the future I don't, I don't know what was going on exactly but um yeah they pretty swiftly followed each other that's brilliant the the qu the closing quote I use on the podcast is be exactly you and it's something I'm trying to figure out in, in my own life but the people that I see that are the happiest and are moving through space in the most productive and comfortable way are exactly who they are and they've figured it out and they are leaning heavily into that and it sounds like that's exactly what you've done there yeah for sure do you amazing. know the Dolly Parton quote find who you are and do it on purpose no I don't oh dude uh, there you go great. yeah I'll put it on screen right yeah now. yeah yeah I probably am misquoting it but the idea of doing yourself on purpose. Mm. Mm. Take that out of context. That's nice. Girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, the last section of this podcast is about well-being, mental health, and you've segued beautifully oh, into it. Look at that. Most creative people that I speak to... Are hot messes. Yes. Yeah. And they actively have to work really hard to maintain some sort of equilibrium. Mm. What do you put in place to make sure that your head is okay? I burnt out really badly about two years ago and actually went back to full-time work. Oh. And so at the end of this year, I quit my full-time job and went back into drag because I was really unhappy. But I learned a lot having burnt out like completely to the point of being like, this thing I love and am obsessed with, I'm going to like take a big step back for a while and now going full throttle back into it and being really happy. It's a feeling of like being on summer holiday. Do you know that feeling where you're just kind of like, 
Hmm. Or it sort of feels like the sun's shining. Like I haven't had that in a long time and I, f I really feel it this year. And that's been really cool. That's, so I, that's amazing. And the fact you're so busy because you're incredibly busy. Yes. That means it's, it's, it's good. It's Life weird. is good. Yeah, it's weird when you can have a job that takes you to both in terms of stress and, and adrenaline because you, you spike a lot. It requires a lot of energy and that's hard to emotionally regulate through. And then also because it's so to make a living doing this very strange alternative art form, um, life pulls you in a million directions and to still be emotionally regulated enough to be happy is pretty wild. The things I learned after burning out last time are like people. So no one's getting paid enough in this industry to work with bad people. I would argue that no one anywhere is getting paid enough to work with shitty people. Mm. Um, so um, dedicating like way more time to being a nice person, that's like a big part of it. Um, yeah, I've, I will always be working on that, but I've, I've learned a lot. Um, and yeah, surrounding myself with like mean people, not just to work with, but like in my life. And yeah, a lot of that is boundaries as well. You know, you can have amazing people around you, but I do like a bunch of stuff to like maintain my peace. And sometimes that's like, I actually can't hear about that relationship anymore. Like, or like, you know, like, I, you know, gay people are fucking chaos. And a lot of the time I'm like, I love you so much. I value you in my life, but like, don't date that person again. Or like, um, or like you like I've had people who've been in like toxic jobs or whatever or um had people who've like um trans activists who their absolute passion and obsession is politics and I've been like I actually can't listen to this anymore mm -hmm. um so setting up boundaries around that has been really really good for me and I'm constantly negotiating with myself ways to do that while not being while being respectful of the full spectrum of who these people are and yes so in terms of working yeah man yeah. I could talk for a whole hour about how I've figured out how to work in a way that's like remotely sustainable and I I don't think I'll ever figure it out but yeah living in Auckland has helped a lot mm. because there's just that tiny little bit more work and a tiny little bit more money where I can just take the gigs that I want and that's really awesome because you're not doing you're not gigging you're not taking garbage or garbage money. Um, you can be like, actually, I, even though that pays awful, I really want to do that project. And actually, that corporate gig does sound worth it. I will, I will be joining you on that day. Yeah. See you there. Sign me up. Yes. Thank you so much. One very clever thing I've noticed you do is you make a lot of work. I guess for your not for yourself. Mm. Yeah. No. I suppose for yep. yourself and for other people. Yep. That's an OG strategy because when I started, it was the only way I was going to get spots because oh. this is like nearly, oh my God, nearly 10 years ago. No one was hiring drag kings. Mm. Drag wasn't even like popping off in yeah. Wellington where I was. So um, yeah, I had to run shows. It's probably the most sustainable way of making sure you're employed as an artist in general. I think it's really clever. Everyone's producer, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And I do pride myself on running like good drag shows. Oh yeah. Like even if it's just a little cabaret, you know that the lineup's gonna slap and all the details are right. It's gonna be smooth. It's gonna run on time. It's gonna be worth your twenty five dollars. Mm. Yeah. The notion of drag right now, I think, is really exciting in in terms of it feels like it's on the up. And one thing I was thinking about as I was sipping my wine watching you last Sunday is that. It is so stimulating on so many levels. You've got steady, out of context, to camera. You've got physical, you've got music, you've got comedy, you've got bright colors, mm. you've got every, it's like literally, you know, as more people are realizing their ADHD as well, it's ticking <laughs> so many boxes. <laughs> yes. You're okay. You're onto something really cool. And that is, it is like, it is stimulating and, and exciting in lots of different ways. And then also somehow concurrently and because it's, it's also just not that deep. <laughs> yeah. Do you or, know what I mean? It doesn't have to be. Yeah. Yeah. yeah which like, is nice in art. Yeah. Like you can go and see 
like over over the years of being involved in creative arts I have found the bit of it that I really give a shit about and it's tacky fucking drag like because I'll go and watch what's meant to be just like a deep intellectual like really stimulating like everything they do is clever some kind of theatrical production and I'll be like I don't care Mm. I'll be like I mean yeah it was cool but like but it doesn't hit you where are my endorphins man like I want I want uh, sparkles and a little costume that reveals and then a little track and you think it's about this and then like you know the classic drag thing where it's like your lips thinking about one thing and then the track changes and it's like a little wordplay a little pun I'm like that's fun that makes me feel joyful and happy yeah um or I'll be like man that is so clever I have no idea how they made that costume thing or like the way you've painted your face like that that's a really clever feminizing thing you've done with the kind of face that you have like I'm just obsessed with every aspect of it and of course it's like genderqueer it's political commentary like it is deep but when you're doing the disco classics in the middle of a restaurant on K Road like at the end of the day it's not that deep it's just fun and yet it's so as you say stimulating it is and you can access it on all of these different levels you can go deeper if you want to of course and many drag performers do and it's magic yeah yeah you can just let it come to you and it's a bit like you know instagram tiktok everything that is so download generation quick and in your face Mm. this is marrying it perfectly drag has definitely popped off in recent years um because it looks the internet makes it look very fun and it's true it is the last thing on the podcast Hit me. is within this book. And if you like this book, you can get 10% off using Jamie 10 at checkout. I do uh, like that book. Do you? I'll hit you up. Is this merch? It's a wonderful company called Dingbats Notebooks. And they do pens and notebooks and oh, things. Oh, this is an affiliate code. There you go. Got it. Got it. Got You're it. all over it. I am. Um, and I use this as my guest book. And we take a little Polaroid with all my guests. And they write a a question to forward to future creative people. Oh my gosh. How cool is it? Jamie, this is nice. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask you some questions from people. Okay. Um, and then you can I'll write in think here of as a well. curveball for them. I'm going to ask you one question from Kelsey. Who's that? She sounds awful. She asks, do you think you celebrate your achievements enough? And what are you most proud of? Oh, Kelsey, those are hard. I'm most proud of being sober. That's In fact, that's really easy. In terms of transition, like I got one big surgery and then I get jabbed with a needle once every three months and it just kind of keeps happening, you know? Whereas sobriety, I like actively choose every day. And while I don't do nearly enough sobriety, would like there's always more I could be doing in terms of like my work on myself in that regard. Um, I am a nice person to be around and I'm a better person because I am sober and it takes consistent effort. And it's hard because I miss alcohol. Drugs are fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm really proud of myself for that. So that's what I'm most proud of. Do I celebrate my achievements? Yeah. I think my I think I don't smell the roses enough. And I'm learning to have make the most of my ridiculously fun job and also just try and enjoy all aspects of the process. Romanticize your life, you know. I am good at what I do because I am like a deeply insecure person. So I'm always hustling for the next thing. Mm. And uh, always I'm a planner. I am an organizer. So it's really easy for me to get stressed over details and like lose myself and lose perspective on how awesome and lucky I am. Mm. I think I could always celebrate my achievements more. If I was 22 and I saw who I am and what I'm doing, I would be so stoked with myself. And I think I should remember that more, Kelsey. That is a nice question. Hell yeah. A question from Kush. What motivates you at your core? I think I know the answer to this. And that is, I want to make people happy. I think it's the most underrated thing in art and in the world. Is just endorphins, adrenaline, dopamine, just happiness. And I think if we were to go a little bit deeper, like trans joy is resistance. Queer joy is resistance. You know, people say black joy is resistance. Like that's absolutely accurate. Like the most, we are surviving, we are thriving, being happy and also creating art that shows us as happy people and as people who are making other people happy, I think is so powerful. Um, And especially in this, 
fucked up era that we're in in terms of all this conversation around drag and trans people it's so important just to show us as as trans excellence as as thriving you're doing amazing things stop it you are thank you <laughs> you're doing amazing things and i'm so pleased that i got to see you perform last week i hope i can see it again soon as i travel around new zealand there will always be more sparkly dumb stuff on for you to see what's next for you what's what does the future hold near or far a dazzling array of strange events is what's in my calendar over the next couple of weeks I'm going to Melbourne Fringe. Cool. Um, and I'm going to watch a bunch of stuff and also pick up gigs to pay for me to watch a bunch of expensive, fancy shows. Maybe like the big event I'm most excited about is Palmy Drag Fest. You wouldn't think that a drag festival in Manawatu would be a really exciting big deal, but it is. And so that's in 11 days or whatever. Oh, cool. 12. Saturday next week. Brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. What's next for you, huh? Uh, some podcasts around. I really am wanting to use this time to sit down with people that I care about, that I think are doing important things in the world, learn from them, mm. and um, do a bit of soul searching as well. I it think. seems like you are doing exactly that. Yeah. Maybe move to Aotearoa. Yeah, maybe. It's feeling like a possibility, and I, there's a lot of things to love about this place. You've never lived here, eh? No, no. Yeah. I've always just travelled through or worked or... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that sort of thing. So a bit more time here would be lovely. Mm. And that's the plan, really. He stands on the precipice. <laughs> hey, maybe you should dabble in some recreational transvestitism. It's quite good for the soul. Maybe. Mm. That might be my next thing. Who yeah. knows? I, I think I would have to learn a hell of a lot. But there's always a possibility. I'll slap a lash on you. Yeah, you, you can. You can there's be. There's a my... woman in there somewhere. <laughs> potentially, potentially. Yes. Historically, yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you scroll back on my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> if you're still listening, thank you so much. Go and check out all of George's work. Where can they find you? We actually forgot there were cameras here. There you go. So there that's you go. Good. That's a good thing. Which is good. I forgot that I look like a gremlin. You can find me at Hugo Girl, H U G O G R R R L, on most social media platforms. Thank you so much for listening. Wherever you are in the world, remember to create with people, connect with people, but most importantly, be exactly you. Until the next time, peace. <laughs>